Uh, my story is called, I Met a Girl Named Bat Who Met Jeffrey Palmer. We could have the Jeffrey Palmer conversation, but it would be a waste of time. Here's how it would go. I'd want to talk about what he wrote, what he took from Alan Watts and what he rejected, how he was almost on the same page as his contemporary Eckhart Tolle, but where the Fishers were and why, why they used such different language. I'd want to talk about his correspondence with Ken Wilber. If you were still with me, I might show you the tattoo on my bicep from a letter he wrote to Wilbur when Wilbur was already ignoring him. Quantification is both an over and under simplification of something so simple and complex as the self. If you were keeping up, I might explain that as much as I find Palmer's work to be true and effective, I don't know if you really understood what Ken Wilbur was doing. You wouldn't be following me. I could tell you about, excuse me, I could tell you about what Palmer thought about Daniel Quinn, Noah Levine, Sun Tzu, Yogananda, Rhonda Byrne. I'd want to tell you about how the beauty of Palmer's writing is how self-evident it is, how little interpretability there is, that that is the point. But your eyes would already have glazed over. You wouldn't want to hear about his influences, who he influenced, or why. Completely disinterested in content or context, you'd be like, man, webcam meditations, though. It just seems like such a silly waste of time. I sure could never waste so much time on that. And I'd be like, I know. You and everybody else. That's not interesting. That's what everybody who only knows him from that stupid Vice article from two years ago says. So when I want to talk about Palmer, I do it on the internet. It's retro, but I post on two message boards, a discussion board about his work and a board for trans women under 30. Last December, almost a year ago now, when I was fucking that boy Charles, when my hair was red and I used to wear that awful green eyeshadow, there was a little convergence where a conversation about Palmer came up on the message board for trans women. And like most times you hear his name, it came up as a joke. In a thread about philosophy, somebody was like, Jeffrey Palmer, lulz. I didn't want to out myself as someone who actually appreciates his writing someone who actually does the work everybody else thinks is so funny. So I just neutrally mentioned that I'd read some of them. And this girl, Bat, was like, oh, I met that weirdo once. Obviously, you can't just be like, OMFG, you met Jeffrey Palmer, swoon. You'd get kicked off the internet or worse. I think I posted something like, oh, cool, still neutral, like neither endorsing him nor disowning him, but I threw up a little. Wow, that's kind of a theme. <laughs> Set the tone. <laughs> I checked out her profile, and she was in New York, too. I threw up some more, but I didn't really do anything, because while I did want to hear more, I was nervous that I would have sounded at best kind of uncool, and at worst, like a wingnut cultist if I'd asked directly, and I couldn't bring myself to ask about him in a mocking way. I didn't do anything about it for a couple days. I remember almost writing private messages to her a couple times, but feeling embarrassed at my phrasing, or at seeming all eager, or at caring at all. So I went to work. I chopped wood, carried water. When I had shifts at the coffee shop at night, I did my webcam meditations in the morning, and when I worked in the morning, I did them at night. I was feeling really uncentered, though, and I couldn't get it out of my head that there was a girl in this town, a girl I could meet, who had met Palmer. Then one night, I let Charles sleep over because he'd said he'd make me coffee in the morning, which was a change of pace. I'm the one who spends all day every day making coffee, and it had made me laugh. I mean, I like Charles okay, but we were definitely not in love. For one thing, he didn't really have a sense of humor. But more importantly, he kind of dismissed my affection for the Audis. He thought the Animal Collective poster over my bed, my primary instance of decor, was just a picture of some ugly blobs, and he wouldn't even listen to the playlist that I made for him. But I was fucking him because he was hot and didn't have weird shit around my body, not because we were emotionally compatible. He was an unimposing guy, only a little taller than me, but he was so lean. He had these small, muscular shoulders, and when he fucked me, he would lose himself so completely that I'd lose track of my body, too. He's the only person I've ever had sex like that with. I mean, when we weren't fucking, he would talk about computer things and his new headphones, the album he had apparently been working on for a long time, bands from now, all this stuff I didn't care about. I tried to be interested, but the interest wasn't there. We would have made a terrible couple. So anyway, I remember very clearly that night he stayed at my house, we slept all tangled up, and then I woke up that morning with the idea firmly in place that I was gonna email this girl. I kicked him out without letting him make me coffee. I wasn't mean. He was very sweet, and he even kissed me goodbye. I made myself a coffee, sat at the computer, and wrote a super direct message. Hey, I actually am kind of interested in Jeffrey Palmer. What was he like? She didn't respond for almost a month. This was back when I was wearing that stroke shirt. Or, excuse me. This was back when I was wearing that strokes shirt every day. That month disappeared into Brooklyn, and then I got a short email from her. She was like, Yeah, totes. I don't know. What do you want to know? Bat. She signed the email. Bat. 
This is how I imagined Brooklyn in 2008. There was an American Apparel on every corner. <laughs> this was before American Apparel became the big store at the end of every mall in America, back when it was still cool, before Dove Charney became the governor of California and sold the company to Target. Everybody was wearing American apparel, tight skinny jeans and tank tops that were sort of oversized so they dra draped across tiny rib cages like ancient Roman tunics almost. Everybody was in their earlier mid-twenties. Bedford Avenue was always so crowded with people of all races and both genders that there were people walking in the street, slowing down traffic, even in the middle of the night. It was like a 24-hour 4th of July barbecue. Everyone was holding a can of Pabst with beads of water dripping down the sides and everyone was tall, very thin, and had long hair, even the boys. The girl's hair was longer, though. Some people would be wearing headbands. Sexually, it was a total free-for-all. Boys kissing boys, girls kissing boys, girls kissing girls, boys kissing boys and girls at the same time, bodies squirming together along the sidewalk like the sweatiest gay disco in the 70s. Total humidity. Everyone was a graphic designer, and everyone was in a band, and every band made dreamy, swoony music with lots of reverb and echo and vague distortion. You'd go, see the tr you'd go see them at the Trash Bar or South Bar or the McCarran Park Pool or go into Manhattan and see them at CBGB's. You'd make out with your boyfriend, who was the singer of the second to last band of the night in the men's bathroom. They'd just have performed and he'd be sweaty, his hair damp, the hollow under his clavicles, and he'd reach his arm around and pull you close and grab your ass and your breath might catch and you'd feel his cock harden his tight jeans so maybe you'd suck him off right there even though there was no lock on the door. Everybody had those iPods that were like four inches long and two inches deep. Most people had the little white earbuds, but some people, your boyfriend, would have big, oversized headphones that kept out the world around them. Sometimes he'd wear oversized, slouchy hoodies. So on any night of the week, since everybody freelanced, everybody would stay up all night doing coke at somebody's beautiful converted loft, either in Williamsburg or out in Bushwick somewhere, making out or watching Wes Anderson movies or listening to the new Ariel Pink album or talking about Jonathan Safran Foer or Dave Eggers' new book, smoking cigarettes and talking, sprawled across black leather couches. The boys all had permanent stubble that was usually just long enough to be soft, but sometimes it was short and rough and it scraped your face when you kissed them. Everyone was a spaced out kind of happy. Everyone had enough money. Everyone was pretty and everyone read books. And all the boys had such thick eyelashes that they looked like they were wearing mascara. And all the girls were the kind of tough that boys can't even be. After I got Bat's email, I did some math. Palmer died in 2011, so if she met him, she must have been at least 15 or 16 in 2010, right? Maybe younger, but probably not. So that would make her like 35 or 40 right now. She's probably older, didn't matter. I was just already thinking, I'm gonna meet this woman. The main reason that I was already thinking I wanted to meet her was that she had met Palmer and I was going to pump her for everything I could get about him. But another reason is that Jeffrey Palmer lived out his last two decades in Brooklyn. He was one of the original gentrifiers back in the early 90s who came to Brooklyn from Manhattan, back when people still wanted to live in Manhattan. I didn't think somebody who was in her 30s or older would be posting on that message board. Come to think of it, nobody over 30 even should have been posting there, which, my first, which was my first hint that maybe Bat wasn't 100% together. Maybe she'd been posting there since she was under 30 and got grandfathered in. Whatever, it meant that most likely she'd met Palmer in Brooklyn in the early 80s, which in turn meant that she'd probably lived in Brooklyn back then, and it seemed like everybody else who was there then has either gotten old and boring or gotten over all the androgyny and danger, or else they've moved away and don't talk about it. I wanted to hear firsthand what it was like in a halcyon Camelot. The more I thought about it, the more I threw up. I got all twisted up with nerves over talking about Palmer and about meeting an internet person in real life and even about owning up to my obsession with that time period. I shook it off though and sent her exactly the message I wanted to send her. Can I interview you about him? Is it okay if I record it? If I record it. I should know by now that it's never as bad as you think it's going to be to out yourself as anything, but I was surprised that I felt relief on sending it. It was out of my hands. Letting go of it, pushing back against attachment, erasing, of course it was a relief. I drink a lot of coffee, but I usually just either drink it at work for free or steal it from work and bring it home. I can't afford to go out to other coffee shops. It's why Charles and I didn't go on dates. I couldn't afford my half. I mean, I still can't. I still live in the apartment I was living in then. I'm making a little more money an hour at the coffee shop than I was back then, so I'm still just scraping by. But I live in Brooklyn. You know my life story. When I was little, my parents let me wear girl clothes all I wanted, even to school. At school, by first grade, I was getting enough shit from the other kids that I stopped and convinced myself I was over it. Toward the end of high school, I admitted to myself and then to everyone else that I wasn't over it at all and started wearing girl clothes again. Changed my name, got on hormones, moved to New York. 
It's the same life story you've heard from a million trans women. It's pretty much everybody's story, although I guess some of us don't move here. The only real difference in my story is that for a long time, I was super resentful about the years I'd spent trying to be a boy. I was drinking a lot, having bad news sex with jerks, doing too much coke, whatever. To 20, I found, bom I found Palmer's book, The Ephemeral Now, on the kitchen table of a boy whose name I don't even remember. I took it, read it, and started letting things go. So I feel like I owe Palmer pretty much whatever agency I have in my own life. I would have stayed in that town, married and childless, till I died if I hadn't learned to let go of some of the resentment I had toward a bunch of five-year-olds I'd been in first grade with. The 12-year-olds, boys and girls, both kinds of lunch tables, who ostracized me so effectively in junior high, and all the boys in high school I had desperate secret crushes on. I'm not mad about being broke. I'm not mad at being trans. I'm not mad at pretty much anything, and it's not because I actively try not to be mad, it's because I actively try to own, confront, and let go of that anger. It's not complicated. So that's why I decided to spend $8 on a coffee at The Verb with this girl I'd met on the internet. Nobody really knows much about Palmer because his writings were all published posthumously? Is that how we say that word? Posthumously? Because his writings were all published posthumously, and I doubted I'd ever have another chance like this. In retrospect, of course, there are reasons he kept his personal life so personal, and the fact that I wanted so badly to know more about him only shows how far I still had to go in terms of spiritual growth. <laughs> I'm not mad at my younger self about it, though. So I met her at The Verb, that cafe on Bedford Avenue in Williamsburg that's been around since forever, right next to the Ikea. It feels true that it's been there for decades. The wood's all old and dark and chipped, and even though I know that light bulbs go out, instead of just getting dimmer, it feels like the light bulbs haven't been changed in 40 years. When I walked in, Interpol was playing in the speakers in the corner of the room, and I was like, why do I work at this stupid coffee shop by my house instead of here? It would probably start to feel like hokey nostalgia town eventually, but still. I bought a coffee, got a table, and started recording sound. When she walked in the door, I knew this was the woman I was here to see. She looked normal enough, just tired. Her hair was long and dark and cut in these very shaggy layers, limp enough that it might as well not have been a haircut at all, the way it hung. She was wearing an old white tank top, skinny jeans, these cowboy boots that looked ancient, and a short suede jacket. Basically, she looked like me on a good day, when I'm really into my outfit, feeling like I've got a modern version of a cat power thing going on, except instead of 28 and vegan, if I was 60 and didn't really take care of myself. <laughs> Veganism also is a theme, huh? <laughs> Which made me feel tired. Buy me a coffee, doll, she asked, walking straight up to my table and sitting down. Uh, sure, I said, immediately off balance because I had budgeted for one coffee and the eight bucks for hers was going to come out of next week's food money. Once in a lifetime opportunity, I remember telling myself, let it go. So I bought her a coffee, which she immediately started drinking even though it was way too hot. I was like, are you so skinny because you don't eat? Do you think coffee is food? But I had that feeling like I was in the presence of such an unknown quantity that I didn't want to say anything to make her freak out or hate me or leave me and not tell me about Palmer, so I just tried to be cool. I know I shouldn't have recorded it. Or at worst, I should have listened to the recording once when I got home, meditated on it, and deleted everything. But I didn't. I still have it. So hey, she said, you're like a JP nut, right? Kinda, I said, I guess. That's cool, she said. I remember after he died, when kids were first starting to read him, I was like, that fucking weirdo? Seriously? But I guess people get something from it or whatever, so I shouldn't talk shit. Why do you think he was a weirdo? Oh my god, that fucker lived in this VHS tape castle in his own private kingdom of like, wait, okay. You can't hear it on the tape, but I swear to god here she drank the entire cup of coffee. <laughs> I still couldn't even sip mine because it was too hot. I remember thinking, this is a weird conversation, and being kind of bummed out that she hadn't introduced herself, that we hadn't hit it off, that I already knew on some level that she wasn't going to tell me anything that would mean anything to me, spiritually. I already knew that this was a mistake, that I shouldn't have been recording. Okay, she said. So around like 2008, I was friends with that guy, Pete Malkowitz. She paused for me acknowledge that I knew. She paused for me to acknowledge that I knew who Pete Malkowitz was, but I had no idea. He was in that band, The Fourth Joke? Blank look. They had a song in one of the Twilight prequels soundtracks, she said, moving on. That was their big moment. <laughs> Pete knew everybody at all the clubs, and he'd get us into shows for free, so we'd go see bands like every night back when he was still around. Anyway, Pete was friends with this girl, Melissa, and one night he was like, you gotta meet Melissa. So while I was at Pete's place off Manhattan and like Metropolitan one night, this girl, Melissa, buzzes up and he lets her in and I'm like, fuck you, Pete, you, you just want me to meet this bitch because she's trans too? But he's like, whatever, man. He's so fucked up on I don't even know what that you can't even be mad at him. So this girl comes in and she's nice, kind of shy, doesn't want any coke, doesn't want any weed, just kind of hangs out and drinks. 
you know, not a small amount of beer. And then, like, hours later, we find out that Pete went up on the roof and fell asleep, but we didn't know that right then. Suddenly, it's just the two of us in the room. I'm like, so how do you know Pete? And I don't even remember what she said. Who cares? We start talking. All she wants to talk about is trans stuff. And I was kind of skeezy at the time. I was kind of like, whatever. Like, maybe I'm going to play it off. Like, maybe I'm not trans. But eventually, it gets boring just listening to her stutter and hesitate and not say anything. And all I've been able to think of the whole time is like, if you get to pick your own name, why, picking, why pick something so fucking boring like Melissa? I mean, why not pick something cool? Like fat, I say. On the recording, I sound bewildered. I think by this point, I've parsed most of it out, but at the time, you can hear in my voice how alien the dynamic she's describing is to me. So I ask her, and she's like, I don't know, somebody told me that you have to pick something incongruous so nobody will think twice about it. I snorted and hit the fucking bong. I was like, whatever. I remember I was healing this. She showed me a big faded blob of ink on her forearm. And I was trying not to scratch it, but like, whatever, darling. Then the night kind of blurs, and then I guess that's how we became friends. Uh-huh, I said. So yeah, anyway, turns out my first impression was wrong. She was actually pretty cool. She let me crash on her couch for a couple months after I got fired from Capone's. She was really funny, too. You just had to drag it out of her. Uh, she died. But maybe like a month after that, a month after that night at Pete's, he died too, actually. I was at her place, and she was like, I gotta go pick up this coat or something I left at my friend's house. I'll be back in an hour or two. But I was like, whatever. I'm not doing anything, and I've got an unlimited Metro card I found. I don't know how long it's good for, but I might as well take advantage. I'll come. I guess in retrospect, she didn't really want me to come, but back in the day, I could be kind of pushy and like, God knows how she knew Pete, and I didn't know any of her, any other friends that she had, but I figured I was being a good friend if I came along. I was prioritizing that shit, being a good friend. So like, I went with her way the fuck out to like Mapleton or Diker Heights or some shit where you can smell the ocean, and this guy lived in a house, like a detached house, not an apartment, and he had the whole thing. 183 93rd Street. <laughs> so we go in, and she's like, I'll be right out. Like, she expects me to wait outside, but it was early in the spring, and I'm kind of chilly, so I'm like, nah, I'll come in, and inside the house, like, the whole place, from top to bottom, every wall is like a bookcase full of VHS tapes. It's seriously like something out of an early scene in a David Cronenberg movie where it's not totally freaky yet, just kind of weird, you know? Like, just, like, setting the mood. Sure, I said. It's okay, like, whatever. The only thing in this house is VHS tapes, and there's no couches or tables or fucking room on the walls to hang anything. I pick one up, but Melissa slaps my hand, and I'm like, okay, sorry. And we go up the rickety stairs right inside the front door. They've been painted white so many times you can feel your feet sticking to them, like inside an old church or something. Up to the second floor, where it turns out he's in this bedroom, on the bed, filming himself, talking into one of those old-timey camcorders. He was doing webcam meditations. I'm like, this whole house is a dusty pile of old tapes when the whole world runs on Netflix and DVDs and shit. It's hard not to read this without laughing. <laughs> this is my favorite joke in the piece. The whole world runs on Netflix and DVDs and shit, and you're filming yourself with a video camera from 1984 the size of a fucking dog? <laughs> I don't say anything, though. Melissa's like, hey, and dude turns the camera to her, keeps filming. He's like, hey, all pimply face and fat belly and shit, which matches the couple of pictures of him that we've got. At this point, I'm basically salivating and hanging on every vulgar word she says. He's like, hey, your jacket's under the bed, which makes sense that it, would be ha that it would have to be hidden because it's not a fucking VHS tape, and obviously all that's allowed in this house is VHS tapes and VHS recorders and, like, this guy himself. So she gets her jacket out from under the bed. He doesn't even get out of his bed. He's wearing this old black T-shirt with, like, a hole in the seam of one sleeve. He looks pretty gross, actually. Like, his hair is all greasy and he's kind of pimply. Melissa's like, thanks. She digs her jacket out and we go downstairs and leave. That's it, I say. Yeah, pretty much, Bat says. Well, I mean, you know, I found out about his shit later. After he died and they started publishing his books and stuff, Melissa was like, dude, Bat, remember that guy? You met him once. And I was like, who, video McCamcorder? She was like, <laughs> she was like, yeah. And explained how his work was actually kind of important and how he was recording on videotapes because they were analog so they couldn't get leaked the way an album or a movie does. And how he took a magnet to them right before he died, fucking dumbass. Why was he a dumbass? You can hear the defensiveness in my voice. I don't know, man, she says, leaning back away from my microphone. I mean, for one thing, videotapes, they're not fucking digital. You can't erase something analog with a fucking magnet, even a huge fucking giant magnet like the one Homeboy used. Some deep thinker doesn't know the difference between analog and digital. Plus, spilling your guts, watching yourself spill your guts, then erasing it? Wing that shit, man. I don't even get what his quote-unquote philosophy was supposed to be, that all things pass, big fucking insight. 
The conversation pretty much ends here because I got so pissed off to keep, or I got too pissed off to keep being nice to her. I asked if she'd ever read him and she said he, that she hadn't and I was like, so where the fuck do you get off talking shit about shit you don't know shit about? And then it pretty much goes downhill. <laughs> We're not friends. Who cares? Because this is what Brooklyn is like now. It sucks. <laughs> After that conversation, I remember riding home thinking about it, thinking, of course you should let this go. And I mean, I knew Palmer wasn't the most physically attractive guy. That's one of the first things he had to figure out a way to work through, to overcome, to accept and leave behind. He wrote about it. It was hard to hear about it from somebody else, though, especially in such indelicate terms. And to hear the house he inherited from his mother, where he did his most vital work, where he had the epiphany about furniture and clothing and clutter and people and emotions and clearing out clarity, to hear it described in such stark terms. By the time I got home, I'd of course integrated it into an opportunity to let an idol go, to kill a Buddha, but I was still throwing up a little in anticipation of doing a webcam meditation about it. Maybe a long one, maybe an important one. I was thinking about that too though. How did a person get like that? I could sort of understand the relationship between her and Melissa. Like, this was back when trans people were supposed to go, deep stealth, and it was awkward to know another trans person. Nobody ever mentored anybody else, and being trans was totally stigmatized, and people called each other GGs, and T-girls, and trannies, and autogynephiliacs. <laughs> but why be so obnoxious? Cocaine? I've done my share of cocaine, and it didn't stop me from looking for a piece of serenity. And why was she so judgmental? Was it leftover pain from transitioning back in the Stone Age when you still had to get a psychologist to write a letter that said you weren't crazy, even though they all thought you were crazy, and then you had to carry that letter with you everywhere? I know that back in the day, you even had to pay for hormones, so only rich people even got to transition. I don't know, man. I still don't. I try to have empathy, but seriously, fuck those damaged goods. No room for that in my life, even if it's in a context of respecting elders. Fuck a pointlessly moochy and judgmental elder. The first thing I did when I got home, though, was look up VHS tapes. Turns out that was wrong. They occupied this weird gray area between analog and digital. Like, the information they communicated it was digital and that it was zeros and ones, but the tape, the medium itself, degraded from magnetic contact with the VHS player every time they were read. They communicated their digital information in an analog way. So knowing she was wrong about something, I didn't want to believe anything Bat said, but everything else was spot on. The description of 18393rd, the quantity of videos, the attention to his video recorder instead of the people in the room with him. These all fit with what we know about Palmer. She wasn't making it up. I sat down at my desk, turned on my computer, turned on the video recorder, and I started talking. I explained about how meeting Bat had been an impulse I understood from the beginning to be selfish and counterproductive, but as a human being with flaws, I hadn't been able to resist. I talked about how probably she had met Palmer and how she was probably a jerk the whole time that being trans, or having met Palmer, or having lived in Brooklyn in 2008, or having probably seen all the best bands, none of this made her anything other than herself. And who she was wasn't me, and who she was didn't have anything to teach me. I digressed. Of course, there was something for her to teach me. There was a lot to learn from her about idolatry, and euphemisms, and hero worship, and how age doesn't necessarily do anything good to you. I talked about how maybe Jeffrey Palmer wasn't attractive, but that didn't matter. I remember talking about how Charles actually was attractive, one of those thoughts that bubbles up and then you let it go. I finished by talking about how in a macro sense, of course none of this matter mattered, and in a micro sense, it was all an opportunity to learn and grow and strengthen and let go. I watched the video once, then erased it. Then Charles came over.